Along with masks and distancing, one of the most powerful weapons against the coronavirus is information. The more officials know about the spread, the better the odds of reducing new infections and limiting the scope of shutdowns. But officials in Boston are also worried about the growing size of the spread and populations at risk. One of them is our guest, the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Public Health and the district councilor from Hyde Park and Rosendale, Ricardo Arroyo. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Councilor. Thank you for having me. Because I want to start with, with your district, especially the Hyde Park section, because uh, in recent weeks, and I know there have been some ups and downs, but, but the, the figures coming out of Hyde Park have been pretty high, whether in terms of infection rate or positive test ratios. So what do you think is driving that? I uh, wish we had more information to tell you exactly what we think is driving that. Uh, Mattapan, also part of my district, is also in the top three. So Hyde Park in Mattapan, I believe East Boston have been consistently in the top three of COVID uh, infection rate. And the issue that I've had with this since April is that we can be more focused and more precise in how we address this issue, the better the data we have is. Another uh, thing that's going on here is this long trend over time with Boston's Latinx population. Uh, at the beginning of May, I think they accounted for less than 20% of the infections. Yeah. Last time I checked at the end of last week, it was up to 33%. That's a long-term trend. This isn't a fluke of you know, one week or another. Um, right. What about that? So, so here's what I mean about more information, right? Uh, we can make educated guesses, which I think is what we've largely done for the majority of uh, this pandemic. So for instance, you can make the educated guess that perhaps it's because they're not receiving information about COVID in their language, but I'm Latino. And if I, if I contracted COVID and I added to those numbers, that, that clearly wouldn't be the issue. And so it's an educated guess. Uh, you can make the educated guess that it's because Latinos make up more of a percentage of our uh, essential workers, which is likely true. You can make the educated guess that it's likely because we're using public transportation or that it's because we uh, we have we don't have the same sort of uh, homes uh, in the sense that if you're talking about East Boston and you're talking about sort of these houses that don't have a whole lot of space but have a lot of family members that if one person in your home contracts it it puts everybody else at risk because you can't quarantine the same way and, and the resources in the Latin X community it did not go so deep as to allow people to say get a hotel or a motel for two weeks uh, and so uh, there's a number of different sort of educated guesses you can make. And one of the things that I've been calling for more of is a drilling down in the information that we acquire. So we know the gender, we know the race, and we know the age of almost everybody who contracts COVID. But I couldn't tell you in my district, are these, are these positives clustered around specific areas? Are they clustered around specific jobs? Do all of the folks who have come down with these infections or a majority of these folks have some connection to a specific kind of essential work? Is it because they're nurses and we expect that? Is it because they're healthcare professionals and that's kind of part of the job at this moment, unfortunately? Or is it because they're working in essential businesses that opened up early or stayed open like grocery stores and we need to explore the protections we're providing employees at these places? Or alternatively, are they contracting it at these places and we need to explore the protections that we're giving people who are shopping and people who are going about uh, their, their regular errands. And these are the kinds of details that you can get, for instance, by asking questions like, have you used public transportation in the last two weeks? Have you used public transportation in the last week? What public transportation have you used? Where have you gone uh, for you know, groceries or any of these? Where are you working? And what, that extra drill down into the questions is what we're missing. Is that something the city uh, can do on its own and, and it has the resources to do or do we have to look beyond the city for that? So the city really early and so just to be clear, we get race, gender and age numbers and uh, early in this process, I believe back in April, March, when this first began, the state wasn't providing us that and so the city had to go and essentially work with uh, the local municipal hospitals, so all of the hospitals that we have in Boston, and, act, and essentially ask for that information. They have to create uh, a data uh, gathering operation. Uh, but the state can do that and should be doing that. Uh, if the state doesn't step up to do that, the city can again attempt to work with our local hospitals to, to get this extra information uh, available. But it's, it's supposed to be, or should be rather, 
uh, a state-led initiative, uh, and I think it's to the benefit of all. And you know, often we hear things like there was a cluster where people were at a party or people were at a hockey rink. And the question that I have, frankly, is if we can identify those sorts of clusters, why are we having such a difficult time? I don't think anybody has heard yet, I certainly haven't, of a, of a Boston cluster. And so if we're getting to that drilling down in the suburbs, why can't we start to create that, that situation now? Uh, I know uh, the Boston Public Schools are now uh, into all remote learning for at least a couple of weeks, but uh, what about getting more data out of schools? Because in some places, it, it looks as if it's encouraging about school reopening, at least for early grades and in other areas, yep. you don't know. Uh, should there be more transparency and more reporting, perhaps? Absolutely, and part of the issue that we have that I've been very vocal about, uh, I think since the last time we spoke, was that we don't really have true contact tracing. And that is a real issue. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, I think when the city announced its uh, COVID numbers for schools, they were in the single digits. They had a single digit contraction, but there's a couple of caveats there. One of them is students aren't being tested. So the number of students who were coming into the building infected could have actually been long, larger. Um, all teachers weren't getting tested. I think it was 5% is what uh, was agreed to or something of that nature. And so that could also be larger. But beyond that, we have a single digit uh, infection rate with our schools open and you could say, hey, look, that's a success. The problem is if you have real contact tracing, we don't know how many people they went into contact with because they were going to schools that were in the regular community. We have no idea how many people they may have seen on their public transportation commute, how many people they may have associated themselves with at a grocery store that day because they did not know. And so when we talk about contact tracing and how that spreads, we, we actually have to talk about, you know, sure, you have individual uh, cases of uh, folks turning up sick, but those individuals may have, you know, spread that to multiple other people on the way to school, on the way back home, on the way of going about their business because they have to get supplies, do whatever they have to do. When that's the case, those numbers aren't accounted in that, that single digit number. And so when we talk about how this works all the way around, you know, it looks like a marginal success in the sense that we had a low infection rate, but it's not a true infection rate because it's not a, if you were, if you were asymptomatic and you were not tested, which is there's a high probability you were not, if you were a student or an adult going back to school, then we didn't track your numbers. But that doesn't mean that you didn't infect multiple people along the way, including households and families that we are not attributing to your school reopening. Certainly from the Maryland government, we've heard a lot of emphasis on individual responsibility, people having parties or, or maybe some other kinds yeah. of get togethers. Uh, uh, is that kind of attention warranted or do you think it's maybe overdone? I think obviously we want to restrict the amount of people who are doing home gatherings and, and parties. What I would say though, uh, and I've spoken about this before, but perhaps not as publicly, when we open up our restaurants and we tell families that you can come and you can purchase food and you can eat dinner somewhere with six people or more, I think the state is nine people, uh, the city is six is the restriction. But when we say that, it's very difficult for families, especially I can tell you as a Latino who has a family culture of eating together with family, to then tell them you can't meet up and eat for free. You can't do that at home. You can't have a home dinner but you can go to the restaurant down the street and eat together if you want to do that. That's not going to compute. And so when the state comes out and says things like, we need less, we need more personal responsibility. We need more people, you know, not having these events at their homes, not doing these kinds of gatherings, but then says out of the other side of their mouth, we're going to still have all of these businesses running though. And you can go to those and you can go to those in the amount of numbers and you can do exactly what we're telling you not to do at home at a restaurant. That's, that's not going to compute the same. And if you have language access issues, what I've told people all the time is a lot of the way that folks who have language access issues in the sense that they don't speak English fluently, they watch, they're very perceptive, they see what's happening around them. And so they can sort of judge what they should be doing based off of what they're seeing. And if they're seeing restaurants open, if they're working at restaurants that are open, they may not see what the big issue is if they want to celebrate a birthday with their family at home. And so when we're talking about, you know, how this works. I think part of the issue that I have had with this, and I've been vocal about this, is we've seen a steady increase. We're now around 6%, uh, the middle of 6% on the climb. Uh, we, were, we were as low as two or three uh, about a month, a month and a half ago. 
those numbers have steadily increased, but we've dialed back nothing. Uh, and so when we talk about that and we do these kinds of conversations where we say we need more data, which I think everybody agrees we do, but then we say, okay, alternatively, we can make educated guesses as to why there's an increase. The next step is to say, what are we scaling back? Because it's increasing. And it's increasing uh, comparatively with the, the openings that we've had. As we've opened things up, as we've created more ways for people to come into contact with each other, that rate has gone up. Uh, Dr. Fauci has said that as the weather gets colder and more people are, are driven to indoors, we're gonna see even more of a spread because you're gonna see family gatherings that used to be able to be done outside or things of that nature then move to the inside of a home and then that will spread. So as we talk about all these things, we have to talk about how are we gonna dial this back or do we just wait till we hit that number where everything gets shut down? And uh, I haven't been satisfied with uh, the, the roadmap there. And I, I actually would say that I haven't totally heard a roadmap yet that accounts for where we should start to dial back indoor dining. When are we gonna scale back all of these different things? And I think it's only fair to our businesses that have had to reopen to uh, and our constituents who are, are really wondering when and how these things are gonna take place because I don't think it's fair to a business to say today is Tuesday and we're gonna shut down everything today and we've given you no warning about this in advance. And so your workforce is gonna to have to deal with that. You as a business will have to deal with that. And so I'd like to see us as a state and a city start to roll out where these things are gonna happen. Where are the red lines? We had one for schools, we knew what it was, everybody was aware of it. That doesn't mean everybody enjoyed it or was happy about it, but we knew when we get to these numbers, we have to scale these things back. I haven't heard a, sim a similar plan for any of our economic engines, any of the things that we've reopened. I know lately we have had uh, a sort of a climactic episode in this long debate over the fairness of testing for entry into Boston's exam schools. But one question that, that came up at uh, last week's Marathon School Committee meeting was uh, if it were safe enough to administer, administer the test in one place in one day, uh, at least for the people coming in there, um, how fair would that be under pandemic conditions? It wouldn't be. And so part of the issue that I've had with this, even with other elected officials, is we have elected officials who are pushing for suspension of the MCAS, but somehow believe that the uh, standardized exam that we were going to give to enter into our exam schools would somehow be equitable. And the reality is they're both inequitable for the same reasons. We've had six months, give or take, of broken education. And what I mean by that is sometime in March, uh, your child likely went full remote. Uh, at that point, you may have had the resources or the ability to either personally tutor or be with your child throughout that course so that their level of achievement gap or opportunity gap there is, is not so wide. Or more likely than not, you are continuing to work. Uh, your child may or may not have had technological access, uh, may or may not have had a, a teacher who was better versed in how to do online learning, may or may not have had a child who did not suffer from some sort of uh, learning disability that created a harder, a hardship for them to try and learn online. Um, and the reality is you extend that for six, seven months and you have a level of uh, inequity uh, that has only grown larger. If you have the ability to tutor folks, if you have the ability to pay for tutors, if you have the ability to pay for programming, if you have the ability to have high level technological equipment that allows your child to actually have an uninterrupted education, that child is likely gonna do better on a standardized exam today than a child who didn't. That doesn't mean that that child is now more equipped to, to handle the rigor or the uh, education of one of our examination schools. And so the reality is what we're talking about is even if you could administer an exam tomorrow, that doesn't mean that those inequities that exist now that did not exist six, seven months ago or existed to a lesser extent are not gonna play a role in which we've only made this exam more inequitable because all of the things that used to count before count even more. And what I mean by that is all, that, all those prep courses cost more now uh, and are, the, the gap is larger. All of those folks who have technology available to them in a way where they did ha didn't have, where they weren't waiting, for instance, for BPS to bring them a Chromebook for two, three months so that they could access education because they already had a computer, that gap is larger. Uh, and so, you know, there's a number of different issues there beyond just the health issue that creates uh, a real inequity system, a real inequitable system. Uh, and I think the reality is there's a gap that we haven't been able to measure yet uh, that will eventually be measured or assessed uh, between our students who have uh, essentially been learning remotely since April or May of last year and students who have had the ability to 
uh, have extra tutoring or have had a teacher at home like I did where my mom was at home and I likely wouldn't have suffered uh, as much during this gap because my mother was a Boston public school teacher and my father taught college classes, right? So if I come from that background, I'm likely to have less of a, of a gap in my learning uh, than anybody else. And that doesn't make me any better or smarter or more intelligent or able to handle rigor. It is a blessing of my birth. And when we talk about the standardized exam uh, being uh, given that way, my ability to outperform somebody else would not be based on the fact that I had more ability or more intelligence or any of those things, but on the fact that I've had more opportunities to ensure that my gaps weren't, weren't so wide. And so that's, that's really why we can't give one right now. Um, and if you wanted to get into the logistics of it, you know, nobody at this stage with a growing increase in COVID rate would have been able to administer this exam in person in some central location. The bar exam, for instance, was remote this year. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Thank you for having me. Get Boston City Councilor Ricardo Arroyo. We'll have more news in just a moment.